I'm Hugh Collingbourne, Director of Technology with Sapphire Steel Software, and this is the third video about adventure game programming in various different programming languages. And in this one, I'll be considering the problems of creating rooms and maps. Just about the simplest way to create a map is to have an array of room objects. Each room is identified by its position in the array. So here in this Ruby program, I have an array in which treasure room is the first element at index 0, dragon's lair is the second element at index 1, and so on. Each room may contain some treasures, which are themselves stored in an array. Then there are the exits, and these are just numbers to show which room is found at each exit. When there's no exit, I put in minus 1. So to the north of the treasure room, there's no exit. The south leads to room 2, that's the room at index 2. No exit west, room 1, that's the dragon lair, to the east. Now the player is an actor object and it has a position. To move it around the map I just set its position to a number, that's an index, into the map array, which indicates the room at that array index. In fact, in this game, you can see I've got a number of classes and I make both the actor class and the room class descend from a thing holder class. And this left pointing bracket here is Ruby's way of indicating that the class to the right is the ancestor of the current class. And you can see there is my thing holder class, which is itself a descendant of thing. The thing holder class just maintains an array of things. That's basic game objects. So those could be an array of objects in a room or an array of rooms in a map as long as the room and the map classes are de descendants of the thing holder class. And if you come down here, you can see that map is in fact also a descendant of thing holder, and its only purpose is to contain an array of rooms. Now when I run this program, you can see that I can enter commands to try and move in each direction. Here I'm trying to go east. Now I'm running this in Ruby and Steel, and I'm actually debugging it, and I've hit a breakpoint. The map here contains a list of rooms, so I look for the current room by finding the player's, and here the player is an actor object, I find the player's current position, which is an integer. And you can look in the debugger to find out what that is, so the position is zero. And then I use that position to look into the array to see which room, if any, is found in that direction. Each direction stores a number indicating the index of the room in the map array or it stores minus 1 if there's no exit in that direction. If there is a room in the selected direction, then I update the player's position. I assign to it the number, that's the index, of the new room, and that's how the player appears to move around the map. So let me continue. And carry on moving around the map. And you can see now the player has moved into position 1, that's room number one. I can expand the game map and see the things. That's the room it contains. And so I've entered the dragon's lair. Now it's pretty easy to create a map in the form of an array in whatever language you happen to be using. And if you're new to adventure game programming, you may find that this is the simplest way to get started. Here I've used a similar technique in this C Sharp game. This time, however, I've used a .NET generic list, that is, a list that's typed to hold room objects using this syntax. Even so, the essential technique is similar to the one I showed in Ruby. And as you can see when I run the game, here I've got a, a form-based user interface, and I click a button to move east, and I now look for a number indicating a room at a given direction. That gives me an index into the map list, and it lets me find a room object at that index. So here I've got the exit is zero. If I go again, and the exit is two, and so on. In this case, I assign the room to a field of the player called current room. So, while the map structures in my Ruby and C Sharp games may at first sight seem rather different, they are really just variations on a theme. In this Objective C version, on a Mac, I've taken a rather different approach. When the player moves, I don't just get an index to the room at any given exit, I get a reference to the room object itself. 
To understand that, you need to know how I've stored the exits in the room class. They're not integers, they are room objects. And when I move around, I move directly from one room object to another. So in this game, there is no map. There's no special class that's been assigned to maintain a sequential list of rooms. Instead, the exits of each room object point directly to other room objects. I should point out here that I could have taken a similar approach in Ruby or C Sharp if I'd wanted to. There's nothing special about Objective C that makes it particularly suited to this approach. I'm just using different languages to show different solutions to the same problem. And I could equally well have created linked rooms in C Sharp and Ruby, or I could have used a map array in Objective C. Let's look at yet another example in which I've used the same technique of rooms linked directly with other rooms. This one's written in ActionScript, the language used to program Adobe Flash. Once again, this program has no map. Instead, each room maintains links, that's references to other room objects at each exit. And you can see this is how I've created some rooms. And when I initialize them, I actually add room objects to indicate the exits. Now, I like this approach because it creates a real network of linked rooms, something that's more like a representation of the real world, in which one location really does lead directly to another location. That compares with the approach I showed earlier, in which the rooms are maintained as a sequential list, and I just fake the connections by using integers to index into that list. But there are some disadvantages too. Let me just run this program. Now, traversing a linked network of rooms can involve more complex coding techniques than traversing a sequential array. That means you're probably going to have to do quite a bit of recursive programming. And moreover, if I just move east here so I hit my breakpoint, now you'll see when I debug this program in Amethyst that there is actually no end point to this map. So I pick a location and I go east and I go west and south and east, and west, and so on. So here I've used the debugger to drill down from one room into the other, and then another, and another, and another. And they're all linked together, and they will eventually come back to the beginning, and I'll carry on traversing the whole network. So in principle, I could go on drilling down, moving from one room to another forever. And the same is true in your code. If you make a mistake, you could recurse you could move through this network endlessly, causing a horrible program crash and potentially very difficult to find and debug bugs. Another problem with this technique is how to save and load again. Now, with an array, you have an option of just iterating through the array, saving relatively simple data, that is, strings such as room names and integers to indicate the exits. Then, when you reload the game, it's pretty easy to recreate room objects from the saved data and add each room one by one to an array. With linked rooms, that isn't an option. If the language you're using has a serialization capability, that is, the ability to create data streams, streams of bytes, and save the objects in binary format, that should be a way out of the problem. Many modern languages, such as C Sharp, Java, and ActionScript, have serialization capabilities built in or supplied in their class library. If they don't, you have to take care of serialization yourself, which can certainly be done, but it is quite complicated. In my ActionScript game, I save data in the form of a byte array. This makes it reasonably easy, but even so, it's not really a technique for novice programmers. I've had to go through quite a few steps to make sure this all goes to plan. For example, up here, I've had to register class aliases to be serialized. And then later on, when I come to save the data, I've had to create uh, an array of game data, and I've had to call methods to write the object uh, into the stream. There's the game data here. And so it's getting quite complicated. And in addition to that, I've also had to create a save load class. 
And the save load class deals with events so that I know, for example, when the re reloading of the data from a file has been completed. Now, if I didn't do that, I might accidentally try to use data before it's all been reloaded. And that will get me into all sorts of problems. So, in short, creating a real network of rooms is a nice technique if you're a pretty experienced programmer. But it's complicated and much more error prone than using an array. But by all means, try out both techniques and see which you prefer. For more hints, tips, program code and special offers, sign up to our newsletter at www.bitwisemag.com mail.